Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Welcome to this week's Constitutional Chats. I'm Kathy Gillespie, and I am with our student panelists, Tova Kaplan and Jeanette Cranach, our operations director, and our wonderful guest, Tom Jipping from the Heritage Foundation. So I think uh, we are waiting. Uh, we're hoping that we're going to be joined by our co-president and founder, actress Janine Turner. She's having some weather issues today and is uh, trying to get on. And we'll also be joined a little bit later by Dakari Chapman, our student panelist, who is actually on the set of Outer Banks. Dakari is a working actor and he was in some scenes today. So he's gonna be with us as soon as he can. Now, before we get started, I wanna thank our sponsor for today, Mr. Dwayne Horner. Dwayne is a longtime friend of Constituting America. He's an important advisor to our organization. Uh, he was a producer of Janine's radio show for many years. And Dwayne is, uh, just uses his talent in so many great ways. And, and we are just very proud and honored and blessed to be the beneficiaries of Dwayne's friendship and support. So Dwayne Horner, thank you for being our sponsor of, this, uh, of today's episode. Now, let me go ahead and make introductions. I do wanna give a shout out to our founder and co-president, Janine Turner, who may be joining us hopefully in a little bit. As you all know, Janine is famous for her role as Maggie O'Connell in television's Northern Exposure. She's the founder and co-president of Constituting America, which launched in 2010. She's still acting, but she's also actively teaching kids about the U.S. Constitution, having given over 540 speeches to classrooms across the country. And Janine is really the heart and soul of Constituting America, the creative engine, and, and keeps us all on task every day. And we just are all very blessed to, to be able to work with Janine every day. We look forward to her getting on here in a little bit, hopefully. I also want to introduce Tova Kaplan. Tova is 16 years old, a junior in high school, lives in Chicago, Illinois. Tova currently serves as the National Youth Director for Constituting America and runs our National Youth Advisory Council. Tova is a three-time winner of the We the Future contest in the entrepreneurial category, the PSA category, and the STEM category. So we like to say Tova is both right brain and left brain. She does it all. Tova is passionate about educating and empowering young people to use their constitutional rights. And Tova, would you like to say hello? Sure. Thank you so much, uh Kathy, um, thank you all for being here. It's always great to have you. Now, I also want to introduce Dakari Chapman, who's going to be joining us a little bit later. Dakari is Constituting America's student ambassador. He's 18 years old and is currently a senior, a full-time college student in South Carolina. Dakari has won Constituting America's We the Future contest twice, once for Best PSA, where he reminded viewers the Constitution is an American thing, so know it, and twice for his short film, Man on the Street. He's also actively involved in our National Youth Advisory Board. Dakari is a working actor, seen most recently in HBO's The Righteous Gemstones and in Netflix's Outer Banks. And he's, as we said, he's currently on the set of Outer Banks right now, filming some scenes. Dakari wishes to be an actor, but also a politician, but says you must be an actor to be a politician. So we will look forward to Dakari joining us uh, as soon as he can, can get on. It's now our honor to introduce our very special guest today, Tom Jipping. And our subject today, before I introduce Mr. Jipping, is Article 4 and 5 of the United States Constitution. Now, Article 4 covers the federal government and the states, and Article 5 covers how to amend the Constitution. And we are so lucky to have Mr. Jipping on with us to talk about Article 4 and 5. Now, Tom Jipping is Deputy Director of the Heritage Foundation's Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He's a senior legal fellow in the center, 
which is part of the Institute for Constitutional Government at the Heritage Foundation. Tom joined the Heritage Foundation after 15 years on the staff of U.S. Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, including several years as chief counsel on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Tom has developed a national reputation among liberals and conservatives as an expert in the federal judiciary, in particular, the appointment of federal judges. Tom has testified before legislative committees in the U.S. Senate and House and in several states. Before coming to Washington, Tom clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Circuit. So Tom Jipping, welcome to Constitutional Chats. And we would love to have you kick off by just telling us a little bit, just give us a little overview on both Articles 4 and 5, and then we're going to open it up to some questions. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here. This is a, a tremendous program that you're doing. It, there's probably nothing more important in our uh, republic than a, a better educated citizenry. I, I was looking a little bit at history, um, Thomas Jefferson said in 1789 that whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Uh, and uh, James Madison, when he was president in 1810, he, in his State of the Union address, he said, a well-instructed people alone can be permanently a free people. So what, what you all are doing is, is helping our fellow citizens uh, be better equipped to, in fact, um, handle the kind of system of government that we have and the freedom that it provides. So congratulations on this great program you have and, and thanks for having me on. Um, Article four and five, uh, five as we'll, as we'll get to is probably a little more familiar. Article four is uh, one of the less familiar provisions or sections of the constitution. As you mentioned, it relates to the states in their relationship with each other and also in a couple of important ways the relationship between states and the federal government. Uh, there's four sections of Article 4. Uh, three of them I think are, are particularly important. The first is called the, the Full Faith and Credit Clause. Uh, that was in the Articles of Confederation, which was the, the nation's first constitution. Um, but uh, it was even more important, I think, in the Constitution, which emphasizes that this is a union of sovereign states. So basically, the full faith and credit clause tells states that they have to uh, acknowledge and give effect to the judicial judgments in other states. Uh, so that, you know, you, you have a decree or, or a judgment by a court in one state, and then you cross state lines, suddenly you're not left uh, empty handed, so to speak. And one example of, of how this was used or how this came up practically, people might remember when Congress enacted the Defense of Marriage Act, which was federal legislation having to do with the definition of marriage. Article four in the, in the Full Faith and Credit Clause is that Congress may regulate uh, how the full faith and credit is is, is managed, is administered. And in the, in the Defense of Marriage Act, Congress told states that they had to, that they could decide on their own whether to recognize marriage as performed in other states. So that was an, an example of, of how that gets implemented. Uh, the, the next clause or the next, uh, in, in, the, um, in Article 4 is the, the Privileges and Immunities Clause. That's a little bit of a clunky language, but it's basic. The privileges and immunities are basically the, the rights that the American colonists had when they were in England. They didn't just have those rights terminated uh, when they came to America. So the rights of Englishmen that, that they had before, they continued to have. And here, too, there's a, is an example of how it was implemented. Uh, people may remember a few years ago the Supreme Court had an important decision regarding the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, that had never applied to state governments. It, it, it had always applied to the federal government, but not to state governments. And the Supreme Court had to decide whether it did. And one of the big arguments was that the right to keep and bear arms was one of those privileges and immunities, one of those pre-existing rights uh, that people had, and uh, so, so that issue came up in that litigation. Uh, and then the third section of Article 4 
is called the guarantee clause. The federal government commits to guarantee the Republican form of government to the states. That's a Republican with a small R, not the political party. This is a republic, not a, uh, not a monarchy and not a pure democracy. And that's very, very important and really is, is, a, is a basic foundation for how our entire system of government operates. And it was so important that our founders actually put it in the Constitution as a guarantee. Uh, then, then Article 5, as you mentioned, is the, the article that describes how to amend the Constitution. Uh, there's two steps in the amendment process. There's the proposing of an amendment, and then there's the ratifying of an amendment. Uh, the ratification is always by three-fourths of the states. Um, you know, the, the opening of the Constitution is, is we the people, and this is the United States of America. It's the states that, that uh, uh, decide when something will become a, formally, a formal part of the Constitution. So three-fourths of the states today, that would be 38 states. They always are in charge of ratifying, but there's two ways of proposing an amendment, one by Congress and one initiated by the states. Two-thirds of Congress can propose amendments, and all of the amendments we have in the Constitution were proposed by Congress, or two-thirds of the states may apply for a convention to propose amendments, and if they do that, then Congress has to call that. So you have a balance. Congress and the states have a method for proposing amendments to the Constitution. Um, and of course, there's a, there's a a uh, lot of questions and debate about how to do that. There have been more than 12,000 amendments suggested or introduced in Congress since the founding of the country. Uh, Congress has only proposed 33, and the states have ratified 27 of those. Four are still pending before the states, and then two have expired. So it's a very tiny portion of the, uh, the ideas that people have had over the years for, for amending the Constitution that have actually occurred thus far. So that's a, that's a little thumbnail sketch of Article 4 and 5, and uh, we can take it from there. Well, I think it was a great thumbnail sketch. I love that you started with the quotes. We have a, a really uh, favorite quote at Constituting America as well from John Adams, that liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people. For being our guest today, you're actually going to receive a coffee mug that has that quote on it. Oh, great. That, that's fantastic. I will say, I will say though, that uh, that's inspiring, but, the, but the, the news is not all that great today as far as whether we meet that standard. I, I saw one poll where, because we're going to talk about how to amend the Constitution, 60% of college graduates cannot name a single part of the constitutional amendment process. 60% wow. of college graduates. So we're, wow. you know, we're really filling a, a void here because it's the, the Constitution belongs to the people, so they need to know what's in it and how to how to amend it. Yeah, and I've never I've never heard that statistic before. Um, and I know we want to get to Article Five, but we thought we'd start with a few questions on on Article Four first, because you're right, that is a a lesser known article, I think. And um, in Article Four, uh, Section Four, on the gov on the federal government ensuring that the states have a republican form of government or that each state government is a republic. Can you talk a little bit about, about why that's important and why you think the founders felt that they needed to put that in? Well, if, I assume many of the people who are watching this have read the Declaration of Independence. If they haven't, they should because the Declaration spells out uh, why they were uh, leaving, uh, breaking uh, their relationship with Great Britain. It talks about the purpose of government, and then it talks about uh, how to move forward with a new form of government. And there's two parts to that. One is a foundation of principles, and then second, a structure of the power of government. Well, the, the principles uh, that, were, that they talked about uh, were, were the principles of Republican government. A republic is a representative form of democracy. Uh, one of the founders was James Wilson, who served on the original Supreme Court. He was one of George Washington's original Supreme Court uh, appointees. And he was talking about the difference between the, a republic here and a monarchy in Great Britain. And he, he said, here, 
the people are masters of the government. There, the government is masters of the people. Mm. Uh, in a republic, uh, the, the, the power belongs to the people, but it's not a direct democracy. They don't exercise that power directly. They do so through, uh, it's kind of mediated through elected representatives. And, and that, you know, belonging to the people implemented by a representatives is the heart of a Republican form of government. And like I say, it, it is so important. It helps to define how really all of the parts of the government system work. And it was so important that they put it in the Constitution. Well, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get to Tova here in just a second, but I, I wanted to ask a follow up question about the Article Four, Section Four, and, and guaranteeing a republic a republic as the form of government, because I was talking to someone the other day, and and you know we were making the point that the word democracy is not in the Constitution. But then this person also pointed out that the, they said that the Constitution does not say that the federal government has to be a republic. It only says that the states do. And I, I want to ask, A, in, do you think that's true, that the Constitution doesn't actually say that the federal government is a republic? And B, do you think it's maybe just that the, the founders put so much energy into explaining that, that we are a republic in the Federalist Papers that they thought it wasn't necessary to put it in the Constitution? Or? Well, for, first of all, it is a republic. It's, it, it, it's not, in other words, it's not a republic because it mentions that word in the Constitution. It is a republic. The principles laid down in the Declaration and it, it, everything about the way the Constitution is structured uh, says so. Um, it's not a matter of the one is or the other might not be, right? In Article 4, which has to do with, like, like we said, is, is a relationship between the states and a relationship between the states and the federal government. It does not say that the federal government is not a republic. It's simply saying that the federal government will guarantee a republican form of government to the states. So no, th this is a republic, has been from the get-go, by design, by definition. Uh, you, in, in order to change that, you'd have to have as much a change uh, in the form of government as we did when we broke from the monarchy in Great Britain. Okay. Well, Tova, I'm going to toss it over to you. I know you've got a lot of questions and we're excited to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. So it was really interesting when you were talking about the amendment process and I had no idea immense volume of proposed amendments that is out there and how few are actually put forth by Congress. So I was wondering um, how, how is it decided of the large amount of constitutional amendments that are that people come up with how is it decided which ones will actually be proposed by Congress and put forth as a vote well that that number that I mentioned which is about 12,000 that that's the number of joint resolutions that have been introduced in Congress to propose an amendment that's how amendments start that are going to be or that may be proposed by Congress a member of Congress introduces a joint resolution uh, with the language of the proposed amendment so almost 12,000 have been introduced, just like they would introduce a bill or a resolution or something. Uh, the the con Article 5 requires that two-thirds of Congress must uh, pass an amendment for it to be proposed and sent to the state. So uh, the fact is, 30, and, and I say 33, but the first 10, which we call the Bill of Rights, those were done together. So it hasn't, so it's actually been fewer times that Congress has actually voted to propose amendments. Uh, two thirds of Congress, and I worked there for a long time, uh, it, it's hard to get um, uh, two thirds of a, of a room full of members of Congress to agree on what time it is, let alone something as significant uh, as an amendment. So, uh, you know, constitutional amendments, I think uh, it's kind of common sense would have to really be about, you know, significant national issues that have very broad and deep consensus behind them. And it, it takes a lot of work for that to happen. And then why did the Constitution provide two different ways to ratify or pass an amendment? Like, what was the reason for that? We don't have like two separate ways for other um, processes in our government. There's not two ways to elect a president, two ways to, you know, elect a senator, stuff like that. So why, why did we do two different ways to pass an amendment? That, that is a great question. Here's where 
reminding ourselves that this is a republic is really important. Um, the, the United States of America um, belongs to the people and the states, and the Constitution belongs to them. So even though we you know, delegate a lot of this activity to our representatives and to Congress, we don't give it up altogether. And you know, the Articles of Confederation, which were our first constitution, uh, that had a process for amending the Constitution too, and that shut out, um, or that, that allowed the states to directly propose amendments, I'm sorry, for Congress to propose amendments and then required the states unanimously to approve them. Well, that resulted in stalemate, you know, on anything. So the founders chose to separate these two methods of amending the Constitution. Uh, and the reason they, they did so, and they believed that the states and Congress would be equal in their ability and their power to amend the Constitution is, is frankly, co uh, Congress uh, doesn't want to amend the Constitution in ways, for example, that might limit their power or, or set rules for how they want to operate. And they'll just sit there and, you know, not want to propose an amendment that might be very important. Well, if it's all up to them, nothing will get done. So it's an alternative to remind us that the people run the show, ultimately, that the Constitution belongs to them. And there's a way of, of amending their Constitution, even when Congress might not want to. Hmm. Are there any guidelines for what kind of amendments um, could be passed or any precedent for that? Because one of our comment, our commenters was wondering, like, just commented that it kind of scares them that this constitution that we hold up as like the foundation of our republic could be, you know, I wouldn't say easily amended, but the fact that it could be amended um, and like that was a worry that it could be used, you know, for nefarious means. Is there any like are there any guidelines for what an amendment has to be? I know you said it has to be a big issue of national importance, but like, has it ever been used to deal with a specific issue? Would that be allowed? Like, what are, what are the parameters? Well, the constitution just sets out a process. So, you know, an, an amendment that gets the support of either two thirds of Congress or a convention called by two thirds of the states um, and then is ratified by three fourths of the states can become part of the Constitution. Now, those are huge hurdles to get over. Uh, those are, not, there's not only one, but there's two super majorities there, one two thirds and one three fourths. Uh, the ultimate protection against something, you know, really wacky or unforeseen, you know, making its way into the Constitution, you gotta get that past three fourths of the states. And there's no way that can be done uh, with something that is kind of sneaky or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the one constitutional amendment that was about a very specific issue that jumps to mind was the 18th Amendment prohibition that, that prohibited uh, the sale of, of liquor. Well, that specific amendment on one issue was repealed by the 21st Amendment. Uh, and, and I think people made the judgment that maybe that kind of very specific policy question might not be an uh, appropriate way to use a constitutional amendment, maybe legislation, you know, would be appropriate for that process. So, you know, anybody can have an idea and get the process started, but there's, there's, there's real hurdles and there's checks and there's, you know, there's nothing that's going to get into the constitution because of those super majorities uh, that doesn't have that widespread and deep consensus behind it. Well, and I, I just want to add that I think your explanation of the two ways to amend the Constitution is one of the most clear that, that I've heard, because I it can get very confusing. And I, I wanted to say that when you went through that at the beginning, I thought it was really good the way that you talked about there's two ways to propose and then, you know, the ratification uh, by three fourths of the states. Um, now, on the ratification side of the three-fourths of the states, I, as I understand it, there are two ways that the states can ratify, and I've never been real clear on that. One, I think, is by three-fourths of the state legislatures, but then it talks about ratification of three-fourths of the states by convention. Um, and right. I, the, the only power that Congress has once uh, 
they've proposed an amendment is when it is, they, they can say whether states have to use legislatures or conventions to ratify. Oh, Congress so makes that choice. Okay, I didn't know. Uh, that. All but one amendment to the Constitution, that's in the Constitution, uh, were ratified by state legislatures, just one by convention. Uh, and I, I suspect if, if there is ever another uh, amendment proposed and sent to the states, that the, it'll be legislatures that do that as well. Uh, but that's Congress's choice um, of the method of ratification. So wasn't the one that was ratified by convention versus uh, by the legislatures, was, was that the repeal of the 19th Amendment or was that the ninth? for the 19th Amendment? Uh, the 18th, you mean Prohibition? Oh yeah, Prohibition, right, right, sorry. Um, I, I, yeah. that, that's the one, yeah. Um, and do you know why Congress instructed that it be ratified by conventions versus legislatures? You know, I don't. It, it, if, if you're talking about an obscure you know, element of the Constitution, that's about as far in the weeds as <laughs> it's possible to get. Although it's an, although it's an interesting question because you know, each one of these choices and judgments that are made, there's a lot of politics that go into them. There's a lot of, uh, you know, pressure and different interests involved. Uh, and um, that's actually, now that you've mentioned that, I'm actually kind of intrigued and I might want to look into that. Well, um, and then keeping sort of in that on, I guess on that subject, um, you know, we have got, I, I know we've got several listeners on today that are very much in support of having an Article 5 Convention of the States to propose some constitutional amendments. I know we've got some listeners on who are really worried about it. And I think that may also be what, what one of our commenters, uh, Charlotte Whitmire had written, that opening the Constitution to amend it is scary. Um, it will be hijacked by certain bad characters. Um, so I think there's, you know, there are some people who, who are very excited about this prospect and some people who it, it worries them. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit just about uh, generally the convention of the states and um, I guess maybe first start with past efforts. I know there's never been a successful one yet, but were there any that got close and how close did they get? Yeah, actually there, there have been. I mean, it's not, a, it's not an all or nothing uh, proposition that either you, you succeed with an Article 5 convention to propose amendments or, you know, it's a waste of time. Uh, the fact is, uh, the 17th Amendment, for example, which changed the way we elect senators from state legislatures to a popular vote, uh, there, there were, that, that um, effort began as, a, as an effort to call an Article 5 convention for that purpose. And they got, to, they got within one state. They, they actually got 27 of the 28 states that were needed. This was back in 1912, applying for a convention uh, to change the way we elect senators. Obviously, you know, the, the Senate refused to propose that until that point. Well, when they got within one state, suddenly the Senate said, okay, okay, I'll do it. Congress proposed it and it got ratified. Same thing with the 21st Amendment. We mentioned that uh, repealing prohibition. Uh, that got within a couple states. Uh, I think the numbers there were 28 out of the 32 states that were needed. This was in the 1930s, applied for a convention. It didn't quite get there, but it pushed Congress to propose the amendment and it got ratified. Um, the, the more recent uh, efforts have been um, in a couple different forms. You mentioned one of them, the Convention of the States. The, the more traditional one, is focused on the getting a balanced budget amendment into the Constitution. And folks who wanted that, of course, Congress, uh, the House and the Senate each passed a, a balanced budget amendment once, but never at the same time. So Congress never proposed one. So beginning in the 1970s, some grassroots folks started you know, working on state legislatures to get them to make application for a convention to do it. Uh, they got up to 32 states uh, out of the 34 that were needed to propose. And, and then the, the concerns that you suggested that one of the commenters had raised kicked in. Of those 32 states that said, we want an Article 5 convention to propose a balanced budget amendment, 16 of those states rescinded their applications 
because they were be they became convinced that if you call a convention even for one purpose it might you know stick its hands into other issues and and produce something very very different so they were afraid of that uh, and then in more recent years that effort picked up again a number of those states that had rescinded reapplied uh, and so there, there's 27 states that have applied uh, for a, a convention to propose a balanced budget amendment the convention of the states that you're referring to is broader than just a balanced budget amendment they, they would like to see a convention propose amendments to limit the power of the federal government uh, they they like to see things like term limits for members of Congress, things like this. And, and they're taking, I think, a, a constructive approach to this because they are working from the very beginning on ways to ensure that a convention, if it is called, uh, will, will uh, stick to the plan, will stick to the agenda that, um, that they set out when they make the application in the first place. Um, in my personal opinion, uh, I, I, I don't think that the concern about a runaway convention that would just go rogue and suddenly, um, you know, produce all kinds of weird, bizarre things. I don't think that's ever been uh, legitimate. The fact is a convention under Article 5 is a, is a state creation. The states create that convention when they apply for it. Uh, it's not a creation of Congress, it's a creation of the states, and it's limited naturally by the applications that are made. I, I think that Congress, when it looks at these applications, you know, they, they don't just count all of them together. They don't count ones on this issue along with ones on that issue. But if there are two thirds of the states that have submitted similar applications on the same subject, the convention that gets called is limited to that subject. And then there's other things that can be done and the convention of the states people are really, I think, working on those sort of practical rules and ways of, of setting things up from the beginning, not, not waiting until a convention gets called uh, in order to, to really keep that fear to a minimum. So those are some of the efforts that have been um, used um, and, and that's one of them. There are actually a couple, even a couple of other more innovative and somewhat uh, problematic approaches, but the traditional approach by the balanced budget amendment folks and the convention of the states are probably the two most prominent. Okay. Um, Tova, do you want to, do you have a, a follow-up question or a question? Yeah, so uh, talking more about the amendment process, I found it interesting that you said uh, talking about the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments, that they were all passed at once. Uh, could you talk about that process of how the first 10 amendments were passed and why they weren't just added to the Constitution in the first place and how that was spearheaded? Well, the, the Constitution is our second Constitution. The Articles of Confederation were the first one. And that struck a balance between the federal and the state governments, um, which was tilted more in favor of the states. Uh, and folks thought that that produced a, kind of a, an unworkable system in a practical sense. So they got together to revise those articles. And there was a lot of debate about when you have a written constitution, uh, and the Constitution gives powers to government, when you have a written Constitution, doesn't that mean that if it's not written there, it's not in there? That there wasn't a need to say, this isn't there, this isn't there, government may do this, government may do that. Founders thought that when you give a power to government, that's the power that government has. But there were others who said, you know, I don't know, if you don't, put more limits on it, and then we're talking especially the federal government, if you don't also protect individual rights against the government, it's not gonna be enough to simply say, government, you may do A, B, and C, government's gonna also wanna do X, Y, and Z. So we wanna have protections for individual rights too. Well, uh, the federalists, so to speak, agreed to that, they didn't put it in the Constitution itself, but they did 
uh, add the Bill of Rights. And that's, that's the purpose that it serves, is further limiting uh, the power of government, not, by, not in an affirmative way by defining the power, but in a negative way by saying, here's a line that, con that, that the government may not cross with regard to these rights. If I could just jump in and Toe, I'll go back to you in just a second. But one thing I've always found fascinating about the Bill of Rights that I didn't know until I went on a Constituting America winter mentor trip <laughs> and did the National Archives is that, um, is that there were, I guess, originally 12 or more amendments that were in the Bill of Rights. And one of the 12, I guess 10 of the 12 got passed. And then one of the two that wasn't passed was passed at the 27th Amendment like over 100 years later. Would you want to talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Well, and, and actually just a hair before the, the scenario that you just mentioned, and it's pertinent to what we're talking about here, uh, Congress actually proposed the Bill of Rights after being pushed by Virginia and New York that applied for an Article V convention to do it. So the very first Article V convention applications in 1788 and 89 were by New York and Virginia mm. for the purpose of sort of supplementing the Constitution. And that's what uh, kind of pushed and prodded Congress to go ahead. And so James Madison introduced 12, uh, a resolution that included 12 provisions and uh, um, the, ten of them is what we know today as the Bill of Rights, uh, and, and another one of them, which which was kind of dubbed the Madison Amendment for many many years, it was actually ratified 200 years after it was proposed. The, the 27th Amendment says that a pay raise for Congress cannot go into effect until there's been an election. <laughs> so, you know, uh, Congress passes a pay raise, and you got to actually put that before the people in the sense of having an election before they get the money. So uh, that, I, and that idea, it was proposed, Congress proposed it, sent it to the states, a bunch of states ratified it, and then it just kind of petered out. Well, some smarty pants University of Texas uh, political science student, I think, was doing some research, stumbled upon this, and it was almost like he said, this can't be true, you know, did some checking, Sure enough, the Madison Amendment did not have a ratification deadline, like, for example, the ERA did, and that's why the ERA expired, but the Madison Amendment didn't have a deadline. So it was pending before the states until the states, you know, ratified it. So there was, uh, I think there was over a century when not a single state paid any attention to the Madison Amendment, but 1992, uh, I'm trying to think, I think maybe... Michigan might have been the, the last state, the 38th state, um, you know, got around to it. They took it out of the mothballs and it, they figured it was still a good idea and passed it. And so 200, I think it's 203 years after Madison proposed it, uh, three fourths of the states finally ratified it. We love that story. We tell that it, great? we tell it in schools all the time to inspire students that you know, even a, a college student or, or even a student younger than a college student could possibly get a constitutional amendment passed. And, and I, I think, now I, I, and I don't think I'm making this up, but I think uh, that particular student got like a C plus on the paper or something, right? Exactly. I mean, a, a, the, the professor kind of said, ah, this is a wacky <laughs> idea or something. Well, here we go. It's now part of the supreme law of the land. Right. And, uh, and it is a very practical, idea and you can see how it's consistent with the thinking uh, at the time of our founding you know that, uh, that we don't want you know they, they really resisted the idea of a monarchy of a very powerful you know central government that, that just had no checks on it whatsoever and and that so that was a uh, it's almost, almost a convention of the states kind of idea that they're that they're pushing today uh, was proposed back in the uh, the late 18th century. And that's fascinating that the Bill of Rights actually started out as a, a proposal they wanted it, to bring. It sure did. States. If people want to know what kind of impact that can make, that's it. Toba, I, do, you, do you have another question? Yeah, so you were talking earlier about 
one of the sections that guaranteed that Americans wouldn't lose the rights that they had as Englishmen, that they were worried about losing, um, and which, which rights did they gain by separating from England and forming the Constitution? Well, the, 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 these were rights, um, yeah, like the, the, right to, the right to a trial and the right, the right to due process, those kinds of rights uh, as against the government. Um, as I'd mentioned, the right to keep and bear arms uh, was said to be one of those. Um, it's interesting that uh, Privileges and Immunities Clause was interpreted by the Supreme Court early on in a way that, that kind of pulled the, the energy out of it. Um, and the, the focus of the federal courts in terms of uh, the, the rights that um, state governments have to respect shifted to a different part of the Constitution. There are some judges today, Justice Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, for example, believes that we should have stuck with the Privileges and Immunities Clause, the idea that, um, that we have a common uh, set of legal entitlements uh, as citizens, that, that you know, it's not a completely different set of rights as you go from state to state, that we have a common uh, understanding of that. He, th he thinks that there's great value in sticking with it, that we never should have gotten away with it and that, away from it. And that's a, uh, it's an interesting idea. Things might have turned out, you know, differently with a different understanding of, uh, of what our rights are. Remember that I said at the beginning, this is a union of sovereign states. And the, that idea of a common uh, understanding of what it means to be a citizen of the country is what motivates that idea of a single set of privileges and immunities. Um, you know, well, you had mentioned a uh, an expiration date on on the amendments. I think maybe, especially uh, in mentioning the ERA, mm -hmm. and that has been in the news quite a bit lately. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the ERA because. Uh, isn't there some controversy on that as far as Congress set an expiration date on that amendment and states are still passing it and people wonder, because uh, we're getting so close now sure. to it? Well, the idea of a, of a ratification deadline didn't begin with the ERA. Um, there's actually eight amendments in the Constitution now that had deadlines when they were proposed. Um, the, the 18th Amendment about prohibition was, was one of them. And um, the reason for them is simply that once an amendment gets proposed and the, the, you know, the states need to attend to it, they need to focus on it and make a decision, the idea that it's sort of floating around uh, for decades and decades, unless it's an idea like the 27th Amendment, which is kind of a, a perpetual you know, common sense idea, but uh, the idea that, that an issue that might have been significant at one time, 50, 60, 70 years later, might not be. That's, that's one of the reasons for a ratification deadline. And frankly, uh, the ERA, when it was proposed in 1972, uh, the sponsor of it, Representative Martha Griffiths of Michigan, uh, she, she had introduced an ERA two years before that did not have a ratification deadline. And that didn't get past the Senate. But 1972, she agreed to add a ratification deadline and it did pass both houses and was sent to the states. Um, I, I, think, I think it's important there that no matter what our politics, no matter what we think of uh, the issues that might be represented by something like the Equal Rights Amendment, that we ought to agree that the process ought to be the same and ought to be respected for, for every constitutional amendment, no matter what it's about. And the fact is, it, it did have a ratification deadline of seven years. In 1978, Congress passed a resolution to extend that for a few more until June of 1982, but uh, 35 states ended up ratifying and five of those states rescinded their ratification. So by the 1982 deadline, there were not three-fourths of the states ratifying, and that's why it expired. Um, a few states in the last uh, 2017, Nevada, 2018, Illinois, and 2020, Virginia, did pass resolutions that 
that say that they ratify that 1972 ERA, but that 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 ERA um, expired about 35 years ago. So those resolutions are um, they're worthwhile making a statement, but they really don't have any legal effect. So that's the reason for them. Not every amendment does, um, uh, but sometimes it can be valuable. Sometimes there could be members of Congress or even state legislatures that agree to support something uh, if it's, you know, has that sort of boundary on it, and they might not if it were, uh, didn't have any rules or limitations at all. Okay. Tova, we're getting near the end here. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, well, first of all, why did they only agree to put forth the ERA if it had the time limit? What was the like advantage from their perspective of that? Well, um, the, the ERA, uh, I, I suppose a lot of people think that the ERA arose in the 1970s. People associate it with that. But the ERA was first introduced in Congress in 1923 and had been debated rigorously for 50 years uh, before Congress finally had enough votes to propose it in 1972. And you had uh, women's rights organizations like the League of Women Voters and others, the ACLU, that were strongly opposed to it during those years uh, for a whole host of reasons. The language of it was very uncertain. Uh, there was concern that the courts could take this sort of vague language and and interpret it, you know, a hundred different ways. Uh, the feeling was that legislatures could actually accomplish uh, legal equality between men and women, that we didn't need to actually change the Constitution to do that. There were probably seven or eight major arguments over 50 years uh, that had been debated, and, and the, the sides just weren't changing. I mean, the, the debate was the same in 1969 and 70 as it had been in 1929 and 30. Uh, so, the, so those kinds of suggestions were made. You know, they, they talked to members of Congress and said, well, um, you know, would you support this if it has a deadline, which would help if there's, if there's three fourths of the states out there that would agree to this saying, look, you got to do it, you know, put up or shut up. It's like, uh, you know, here's your deadline, do it or not, um, and some folks, you know, would be willing to do that and support it for that reason, figuring that if it doesn't have that kind of support in that amount of time, it's gonna go by the wayside. So it was for a very practical political reason. Uh, those debates, I've, I've actually been working on a research project on the ERA's history in terms of the, uh, there were, um, I think more than 30 hearings in the House and the Senate over those 50 years uh, with, with probably a couple of hundred witnesses, uh, some of them lasting three and four days, uh, and the issues uh, and the kind of the divisions about it uh, never changed. So I think the proponents finally said, look, we got to try something else. We have to try a little different strategy here to kind of shake this thing loose and get it before the states. If they ratify it, fine. If they don't, okay, uh, but we got to get it moving. And that was one thing that they thought could help move it along. Right. And then we had an audience question asking, is there, there's a popular movement to propose a two-term limit for elected members of Congress, as you mentioned, and they were wondering, would that be a possibility via a convention of states? Do you think that that could happen? Well, uh, one of the reasons why in order to impose term limits on members of Congress, um, you have to use a constitutional amendment as the Supreme Court had a decision on that. I think it was around 20 years ago or so. There had been a movement by state legislatures to impose term limits on the members of Congress elected from that state. And that went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said states can't uh, add to the, the qualifications for serving in Congress, uh, that's, that's laid out in the Constitution. So if you want it, you'll have to amend the Constitution. Well, uh, you know, I'm not a betting man, but um, if I were, I'd know how to make some money by betting on whether Congress is going to propose an amendment limiting their terms. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a natural candidate for using the Article 5 convention approach and I do think, uh, I think two terms is, is probably fairly brief. I've, I've heard others talk about more like maybe 
four, five, six terms or something, because, you know, otherwise it's four years and they're, they're gone already. But that would be a candidate for an Article 5 convention. And I do think the convention of the states folks have said that that's one of the issues that they think they would like to see a convention address. And, and, and there, you know, there, I didn't mention before, there's no guarantee that if an Article 5 convention is called, that it will propose any amendment at all, okay? The fear is that it could propose amendments on other subjects. I mentioned how I don't think that's a legitimate fear, but there's no guarantee that the, that the convention will actually propose an amendment at all. Uh, the convention of the states folks, I think the approach they're taking is more different subjects and then would allow a convention to deliberate and to consider alternatives. And if they chose then, to come up with an amendment to send to the states. Um, one of our listeners is Mike Capic, and he's actually the author of a book, Conventions That Made America, A Brief History. And I think Mike in his book makes the point that, that for 400 years, our country has had a history of, um, of people coming together to solve problems uh, in the convention way that legislatures couldn't. And of course, our country is not 400 years old, but I, I guess, you know, when the colonists were here and even uh, when, you know, we were under control of other countries. Um, do you, would you want to talk a little bit about how uh, conventions have been used, even though maybe they haven't successfully proposed an amendment? Do you, have there been conventions of the states that have done other things? Oh, sure. In fact, uh, you know, when you say convention to a lot of people, they might think of the Constitutional Convention. Now that was a little bit different. It, it wasn't a convention to propose amendments to the states uh, and it came together in a little different way, but that was a, an example of a convention of the states. The, you know, the, the, the states sent delegates to that convention. They voted as state delegations uh, and they produced the Constitution. Um, and there's a, I know Professor um, Rob Nadelson, who I know has done a lot of research and scholarship in this area as well, has documented extensively uh, both large and small, like national and maybe regional um, uh, conventions, if you want to use a broad term, where states got together uh, to, to address issues of this kind. Um, yeah, even though an Article 5 convention itself hasn't actually been called, we mentioned ways that it has had a big impact, but that type of approach has been used uh, many, many times in American history. Well, this has been fascinating, and this sounds like a, a, a good question to wrap on, going back to the beginning, really, where we started, which is the, uh, the Constitutional Convention, which I guess, you know, we'll be celebrating the signing of the Constitution on September 17th uh, on Constitution Day. And we just want to thank you. You have been a wonderful guest and so knowledgeable. You have got such a depth of knowledge. I don't <laughs> think there's anything that we threw at you today that you didn't know or, or know something. I, I, I hope my mother gets to watch this and, you know, <laughs> and hear those words. Um, it's, a, it, it's, just, it's just it's a fascinating area that I've been able to study and participate in in different ways. I, I've really been blessed to be able to, to, to do that. Um, and, and seeing it from the inside when I worked in the Senate was a, a real eye opener in, in a whole bunch of ways as well. So uh, I really appreciate you having me on. I, I did want to mention, if I could, the, uh, the Heritage Foundation has a very a useful resource, the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. It's unique in the sense that every clause of the Constitution has a separate essay by a scholar, by an expert, that explains it and provides additional material and information. So it literally, clause by clause, section by section, it explains uh, each, each part of the Constitution, I think from the perspective that America's founders had. Uh, it's, it's, you, it's the only resource like this out there, it's free. You can, you can get that at heritage.org, you can, you can get it, download it to a, a mobile device uh, if you're really interested in it. We, we have, the shortest and the oldest written constitution in the world. And it only takes about 20 minutes to read. I'll have to say, sadly, I took two courses in constitutional law in law school and never had to read it. Uh, I did, but I didn't, wasn't required to do that by my professors. But 
every American should. That Constitution belongs to you. It's the rule book for your government. And, and that's, that's a handy way, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't have mobile devices. You do today. So you can take it with you uh, and find out more about uh, your constitution. Uh, and uh, the Heritage Foundation is, is really happy uh, to provide that for the country. Yeah, we love that resource at Constituting America. We love the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. I, I use the online version, and I've also got a nice big hardback blue book, the Heritage Guide to the Constitution. It's a good-looking book, isn't it? It is. And once again, we want to thank our sponsor for today's program, Dwayne Horner of Texas. Dwayne is just a great friend to Constituting America, a great advisor. I want to thank all the donors who were watching the chat today. Uh, I, Lola Reinch is on. Thank you so much, Lola, for all you do to support us. My dad is a huge supporter, Don Hay, Linda Bartlett, um, all of you who uh, so generously donate to Constituting America. We appreciate uh, what you make possible for constitutional education. Mm -hmm.